Welcome to episode 18 of Woo Woo for the Skeptic. I'm Kim Pullender, your host and curiosity advocate for the world of metaphysics. Today is focused on how to shift out of career doldrums. Do you dread going to work every day? Do you feel like you're stuck because you don't know any other way to pay your bills? And does tuning into divine guidance mean that an angel in a fiery chariot will visit your bedroom at 3 a.m. telling you what to do? These questions and more on today's show. I think everyone at some point has experienced the dull sensation that your 8 to 5 job is sucking your soul into a pit of passionless indifference towards life. Or maybe that was just my experience. At any rate, we all have bills to pay and are committed to a certain job to pay them. When you think about a job that brings you joy, what comes to mind? Is the concept even attainable to you? And what sorts of things hold you back from pursuing your dreams? If you feel you might be in a rut, today's interview will offer some helpful tips on steps you can take to make shifts in your career. I love the quote that says, When you want something, the universe conspires to help you achieve it. Today, my guest is Jennifer Taylor, best-selling author and CEO of Quantum Touch, Inc. Jennifer has dedicated her life to helping people just like you discover the healing power of love. She has grown Quantum Touch, which is an energy healing medicine, from a small company into a multinational corporation based on a foundation of love, compassion, and divine guidance. And a side note is that Dr. Oz has called energy healing the medicine of the future. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the show and welcome. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited to speak with you today. Tell everyone first your personal background and how you took an interest in career and money management from a spiritual perspective. So let me start with my story. First of all, I have a degree from Cal Poly in computer science. And so I started my career out writing software. And quickly into my career, I realized that it wasn't the job for me because I just, I felt depressed at my job and I felt like I was meant to do something else. I just didn't know what it was, but I was meant to do something else. So through a series of synchronicities, I ended up as the CEO of Quantum Touch. And I discovered that energy medicine was my true passion. And I'm, I'm so blessed that I was able to follow my true passion and do energy medicine as a career. Now, I also discovered that when I started to follow my heart and do my true passion, that the money side didn't work out very well. I ended up going into an incredible amount of debt with our business. I think my total personal business debt was about $135,000. And I got into this question about how can we stay in our integrity, stay in our spiritual alignment, and still run a business or do a practice? And how can we also create financial alignment doing this? So the next part of my journey after I made a vast amount of financial mistakes was discovering how can I really create alignment doing all of this? So I discovered how to do it. I had a few wake-up calls along the way. And as part of that, I wrote my book called Love Incorporated, The Business of Doing What You Love, and in my hope to help other people not only life purpose and livelihood, but also create a financial alignment doing it. So that's a little bit of my background. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's always those um, tough life lessons that (laughs) kick us into gear. I had a few wake up calls, that's for sure. Yeah, I think we all have me too on a personal level. So I, I hear what you're saying. So talk to me a little bit about this concept called abundance consciousness. So I feel that I'm a proponent of what I call financial alignment, meaning that your finances really align with who you are. I know that's a little esoteric, so let me give you an example. So if you're making money doing something that you're just doing for the paycheck, I feel like the finances are not really in alignment with your truth. So ideally, I feel like the first step is to really understand the question of why am I here and what's my life purpose? 
And the second step is really once you've discovered your life purpose and you go out and start making money doing your life purpose is now how do I align my money so that I'm making enough to support my living and support what I love to do and also putting money into savings and doing all the right stuff financially. Because what I discovered that many people get into their life purpose and they struggle with the money. Like I've actually met people who are homeless who just have this loving, beautiful spirit and want to do what they love and they can't afford rent. So basically, I feel like I want to help people both discover their life purpose and also how do you make the money part work? Where do you begin? Let's just take someone who, okay, I'll take my own personal example where I was in IT and it was a career that used to be in alignment with me. And then I went through various spiritual, we'll just call them awakenings. And I felt that there was a different purpose for me But now at that transition time, like learning to, not learning, but being able to make money to support this new spiritually guided career, what would be a first step or what would be a step that someone who is struggling to support themselves in a spiritually guided career, what are some steps that they could take? There's a bunch of different things. One is I'm really a big proponent of following your divine guidance because I feel that when you connect with your divine guidance, it'll lead you in the direction of alignment. The second thing that I've noticed with a lot of people who are doing something in the spiritual realm as their life purpose, generally have also a sense of questioning their worth. And I feel like it's important to understand that we are providing an incredible amount of value to people by helping them in their spiritual work. And I know a lot of people who are doing coaching or spiritual healing and they're they're really undercharging. You know, some people charge very little money or, or give their work away for free. And my message is that it's okay to charge money for your work, even if you're doing spiritual healing work. So that's area number one that I feel is that shyness around really owning and claiming your value as a spiritual healer. The other area that I've seen, and this is where I went wrong, (laughs) is uh, really spending money in a way that was out of alignment with who I am. And generally, like a lot of people, I was living above my means. I was spending more than I was making. I was going into debt with my lifestyle because I felt like I should be abundant. So I deserve to spend all this money on everything. And what I realized is that You can feel abundant with real less. You can feel abundant with doing what's in alignment and not overspending. You can feel abundant by living within your means. So those are kind of the two areas. So you've mentioned how, you know, like when you go on a diet, it's never any fun to be restricting food. And so the same thing can happen when it comes to money. So what are some tips that you have for living, you know, within your means, but not feeling like you're on a financial diet? Yeah, I know. Diets, diets suck. I feel like you're constantly uh, feeling deprived. What I learned was that there was quite a few things I was spending money on that really didn't offer a lot of joy to me. I feel like the same thing applies to food. There's a lot of food that we can eat that really doesn't offer a lot of joy. For example, you know, that first bite of chocolate can feel really good, but the entire bar doesn't. I think it's about really a higher level of awareness of where we spend our money and does it really feel good overall. So I'll give you an example. I used to have two places to live. I had a place in Los Angeles and a place on Kauai, and I'd bounce back and forth between the two. And I realized that this lifestyle was real. It was a lot of work to maintain two places. So overall, um, it wasn't adding a lot of joy to my life to be doing this lifestyle. And now I live in one place, and I feel much more relaxed. Another example is... uh, Okay, shoes. I have a thing for shoes. I would just go out my shoes. And you know, it was it was fun to go buy shoes and I was spending a lot of money on shoes, but I realized it wasn't really bringing me much fulfillment. I mean, other than the few pairs I would just I would just like wear just a few pairs, right? And then I had like 30 other pairs that really just sat in my closet and really had no purpose. So, it was that kind of awareness of saying, does this really bring me joy when I spend money on this? 
Hmm, I love that perspective. Yeah, because so often, and I had been in a ton of financial debt as well, credit card debt from 20s and 30s. And you get in this kind of zombie mode when you're spending. And you're right, there's not a lot of joy when you're overeating or overspending, you just kind of do it out of habit. And to take awareness to that, it's a really great tip. Yeah, I think in a similar way, a diet really is about creating food alignment, right? Because severely restricting calories is is non-sustainable, right? So to create overall long-term health, it's really just aligning your, your food with who you are. So really like overeating produces very little joy because you just, you feel horrible afterwards. So you just over consumed and with money, there's very little joy after a certain level of spending. In fact, there's this uh, curve called the fulfillment curve where it's like a bell shaped curve. And at the top of the bell is your maximum fulfillment. And then if you start to spend more than that, actually it's been proven that your fulfillment levels actually go down. So for someone who is perhaps noticing that they are kind of spending without thinking or feeling, what's a way for them to start tracking this? I think we all have a knowledge of where we tend to be spending money in zombie land. Everyone has their thing that they spend money on. For some people, it's electronic toys. For some, it's clothing and shoes. So really understanding, it's almost like an addictive pattern, It's similar to, let's say, an addiction to alcohol or whatever else is going on. It's understanding the trigger to go down that route. So, for example, with shoes, a lot of times, like you people buy shoes, they don't really need shoes. Uh, They just want to buy a pair. It's usually triggered by, let's say, a feeling of anxiety or self worth, or there's some negative emotion that usually triggers the pattern. So for alcohol, for example, is usually anxiety, stress, or, or wanting to numb out. And so for uh, shopping, understanding just this level of awareness of why you're purchasing this, just taking a moment to pause and say, oh, I'm feeling anxious today, or I'm feeling rejected by my boyfriend or, or whatever it is. So I'm buying a pair of shoes because of that. Just that stepping back to take that level of awareness of why you're doing that. Yeah, I really like that because you're right. There is always a trigger that's going to kick you into um, emotional eating or emotional spending and whatnot. So that kind of leads to the next question about the emotional component or perhaps the limiting beliefs behind spending, zombie spending. Do you have any guidance on how people can start to look into what is behind the trigger? The trigger is usually a story. So I'm just pulling from an example. Oh, my, uh, this guy I'm dating didn't call and maybe I'm not pretty enough. So maybe I need to buy a pair of shoes. There's usually some kind of story that is behind the feeling and everyone's different, but it's really recognizing that there's an emotion behind the story. And then that level of awareness goes a long way towards changing patterns, right? So it's just stepping back for a moment and realizing the emotion and the story and realizing it's just a story, that it's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily false. It's just a story. So so almost like you step out of the matrix, you know, that movie, The Matrix, where you, you step out of the matrix for a moment and look at the story at play. And if you want to step back into the matrix and still buy the shoes or emotionally eat, at least being aware of saying this is an emotional eating or this is an emotional purchase, that level of awareness will start to shift the pattern on its own. Yeah. And calling it a story is so true because it is just that for whatever it's triggering, something from childhood, you know, that's playing out again in a pattern throughout your life. (laughs) I know. I mean, I have a pattern from childhood that got at an early age, I had a lot of kids in school tease me. Like in sixth grade, I, I was bullied by a bunch of girls who like basically um, said, hey, like you're ugly or your clothes, like you're not wearing the latest fashions or they would just really tease me on that. So when you're young, I got this story in my consciousness, like I'm not a, a good looking person or I started to base my self-worth on appearance. And that story got edged in really early on. So one of my triggers, and I'm aware of it, is anyone speaking negatively about my parents. And once you're aware, you can realize, oh, that's a story. That's not true. 
Yeah. And we're so programmed by things like that from our childhood. A lot of my siblings, they have similar programs playing out or stories playing out about, you know, just things like money being evil or um, self-deprecating comments they always make towards themselves as quote unquote jokes. And that kind of self-talk is really powerful to keep you in those confinements, those traps. Yeah. I believe that there's a lot of negative self-talk around money for people. And an example of growing up in a household where you didn't have money. I think a lot of people have that experience of feeling like there was never enough in their childhood. So I feel like either that poverty consciousness kind of is this overlay of their life where they never feel like they have enough or they go the other way saying, well, I'm just going to spend whatever I want because I want to be abundant. So I'm going to live above my means as a rebellion of this childhood. It's tricky, tricky stuff. Yeah. That element played out with my spending, especially in my twenties. Like I was free for once, wasn't being controlled by my parents and could do what I want. And it was a rebellion against my father actually, because he just pounded it into our heads that you always pay your credit card balance in full every month. And it was kind of a, it was a definite act of rebellion against him. So that's interesting that you mentioned that. Yeah, I did the same thing. I'm like, oh, we never had enough as a kid. Well, I'm going to have enough whether I really have enough or not, you know, and went out and just did whatever. And that old adage of paying off your debt every month, as much as I wanted to rebel against that, I think that actually works, you know, but that was my phase of rebellion because in my family, I felt like there was this consciousness that there was never enough. So for you personally, to get out of your zombie mode, it was just first noticing the triggers, noticing what stories the triggers were associated with. And then in my experience, I've always found that the action part, like actually changing the habits is the toughest hurdle. So what do you think helped you overcome that hurdle of actually taking action where you didn't spend as much when I got to a point of, let's say I'm getting ready to buy my 30th pair of shoes, when I get to that point and saying, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to buy this pair of shoes because I'm feeling very emotionally, I'm feeling rejected or I'm feeling this, where I recognize the emotion, the desire to buy the shoes started to go away. I don't know if that makes sense. So just the awareness of that emotion, the feeling kind of dissipated. Yeah, it was similar to, let's say, a person who emotionally eats. If they're saying, okay, like right now I'm eating this entire bar of chocolate because I feel very upset over this behavior of whatever. That awareness can basically sometimes halt the actions in its tracks. Since you are the CEO of Quantum Touch, which is an energy healing modality, did you use any energy work to help you with your shifts? Yeah, I think the energy work can help people release the emotion. So you can feel the emotion as energy and run love into it to release the story and release the emotion. Yeah. And I picture something like even, you know, if if the listener has access to Reiki, if they do that, kind of getting that energy flow moving so that in the moment, like you just said, when you feel that emotion and that story that you can just kind of run that energy and keep it on moving, <laughs> release it. Yeah, it's the awareness that you may have a strong emotion, but you don't need to immediately react based on your emotion. And I think that in society, a lot of people have very strong emotions every day. You know, you see a lot of people acting out anger. In fact, what makes movies funny sometimes is people are acting on their emotions, right? So, you know, somebody's angry, they go out and they drive the, the car and they, they do something stupid or you know, someone's feeling rejected. So they, they just, they're acting out their emotions and it makes it entertaining on the screen. Right. But in real life, I feel like, like acting on our emotions doesn't always create entertainment. It can create problems. So taking that moment to pause and saying, all right, I'm feeling really angry. I don't need to do something because I'm feeling really angry. I have the awareness of I'm feeling angry and doing energy healing or what other tools that you have like meditation or even working out and saying, all right, I'm going to sit with this anger and release it. And then if you, if you are inspired to still take an action, that's okay, but it may not be the same action that you would if you had just acted immediately upon feeling anger 
Yeah, kind of like a 10 second timeout to really stop yourself from going into that zombie mode and really choosing to be aware and sit with whatever emotion you're feeling. Because that's, like you said, people immediately go to, okay, I'm feeling the emotion is coming up, time to numb or time to divert, <laughs> time to go buy a pair of shoes or something. Yeah, either people just act directly on the emotion, right? They're angry, so they're going to go uh, do something really bad. Or they try to numb, which is like, I feel like alcohol is a great numbing agent, shopping, food. They just, they want to numb that rawness of the feeling, right? I think that's really common. People don't want to feel it. Yeah, and it does take some practice because at first when I started becoming introspective like that, it wasn't all that fun. Uh <laughs> And so being able to sit in that moment and sit with what you're feeling and let it come up and deal with it or face it takes a lot of courage, I think, when you're first starting to do it, to start creating those shifts. I think it takes an incredible amount of courage. It's it also takes an incredible amount of responsibility because... To say, like, I'm actually, I'm owning my feelings and I'm not going to go into blame, I think that's really, really hard to do. Yeah, and I think it's just, you know, practice makes perfect, not to sound cliche, but, you know, you have to actually just do it, <laughs> finally. There's a lot of talk around it, a lot of journaling around it, but to actually do it. In my experience, I've found that taking action that first time, the second time it's easier, the third time it's easier than that, and so forth. I think it's really hard to face feelings, raw, like 100% awareness of feelings. I think sometimes it feels like you're going to die, that you feel so bad, like you could end your existence, right? I mean, I think many people have an intensity that that's really hard. Yeah. Especially if you're not used to dealing with feelings, then it can be very intimidating. Yeah. And it can be very painful. I mean, it's like, I think a lot of disease, what I've discovered is pent up emotions that people don't want to deal with. Or the other area is a course correction from spirit or all that is, or God saying your life needs to go down a different course and this disease is the way we're talking to you. But a lot of it too is this unprocessed crap that's buried in the body. For sure. And I like the advice too about going out and taking a walk or, you know, meditating if you do that, getting outside. So a different kind of diversion activity that's actually good for you. <laughs> yeah. And part of it too is... The diversion activity can happen with awareness of the feeling. So sometimes I feel like the feeling, let's say, of anger can be very strong in the body and it's excess energy. So sometimes when you have a strong feeling, it's good to move the body with the awareness of the feeling. Sometimes if you just meditate and you're just sitting in one place, you know, you get like you're almost like shaking. You're like, ah. I got to move. I got to do something. You know, that, that feeling of needing to move. I think go ahead and do that. You can do a moving meditation where you're, you're like cycling or you're going really fast and just burning that energy off while you're fully aware of the feeling. Yeah. I, I use that a lot sometimes, you know, I go to the gym with a particular feeling in mind to process. So I'm on the bicycle and I'm just sitting there like, all right, why am I feeling angry? What happened? What was my story? What was the trigger? What, you know, how did I get to the circumstance where I feel this angry? Yeah, and just let it all flow out. You know, it's interesting too, because usually if you're feeling angry about something, there was a series of events that led up to the, the climax, so to speak. Once I process the feelings, I look at my life and say, all right, now, how did this series of events happen? What choices did I make that led to this spot? And how can I rework, let's say, the patterns of my life not to get there again? Yeah, so taking ownership then. Taking ownership. And, and that's also really hard to do because... You know, like the tendency that we want to blame other people sometimes, you know, <laughs> or blame God. I mean, really, I mean, it's easier to do. I do this. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not perfect. I mean, I have my moments of saying, all right, God, you know, that just, that just sucked. <laughs> really, I got to say, you know, it's hard sometimes to not want to blame and like actually go into the ownership piece. It's, it's a very brave thing to do to take full responsibility and it's hard, but kudos to everyone who does it because that's where we grow. Yeah. And that's just another one of those patterns, those zombie patterns of blaming everyone else. So when it comes to career alignment, now Love Incorporated is mostly focused on how to align your career with your divine guidance. Is that correct? Yeah. It's, it's basically how do I discover my life purpose? And then once I've discovered it, how do I actually make it work 
in the real world, so to speak. And it's basically how to hear and follow your guidance and how to follow your heart and what does that really mean and um, how to take all these challenges that come up and turn them into opportunities, which is one of my big things as well is when you can own a challenge and turn it into opportunity, that's an amazing win. So what would be the ideal reader for your book, the person who would get the most out of your book? I believe it's somebody who has an inkling that that they have a life purpose, like they feel already connected to spirit or source or God or whatever you want to call it. And they have this sense that they're here to do something, that they have a mission. And they're just having a little bit of trouble discovering it or making it work in the world. Now, I've heard this from coworkers before and from friends in the past of well, they're not really happy in their career, but they have a spouse and children to think about, and they can't just stop and become an artist <laughs> or whatnot. So that feeling of those obligations and those responsibilities of keeping someone in a career that they don't feel aligned with, what would be your first advice to them? So my first piece of advice is really connect with your divine guidance, because I feel like there's always a way And it's different for everyone, but when you follow your divine guidance, you'll be led down the path that works for you and your family, because I fully get the obligations. And I don't believe spirit or your divine guidance would ever lead you down a path where you'd have to forego or somehow flake out on your obligations. So that's the first step. And sometimes, depending on your guidance, it may be the case that you start your passion as a part-time endeavor. So you don't give up your reliable source of income, but you gradually work into it. Now, my guidance actually led me somewhere different where I just jumped into my path and it worked out financially. So I really believe in, in really connecting with your guidance and following it. Yeah. And for anyone who might be thinking, okay, I don't meditate. I'm not sure what you're talking about with divine guidance. And maybe they're thinking like a vision of an angel is going to come to them in the middle of the night. What are some of the ways that people can receive divine guidance just so that we raise someone's awareness of how guidance can come through for them in their life? Okay. So first of all, guidance is not a mental activity. It's based on what comes in through the heart not your physical heart, but your emotional heart, like your emotional body and that spiritual heart of your connection to the divine. And so I guess in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that when you do something in life that you love, whether it be petting your cat or working in your garden or whatever it is, when you spend even just a few minutes doing that, it opens your heart and it opens you up to receiving guidance. So I feel like for anyone who's just really struggling to receive any kind of guidance, taking 10 minutes a day and doing something you love, no matter how small, it'll open your heart. Just just even that moment where you think, oh my gosh, this, this is the cutest cat in the world. You just opened your heart. That amount of gratitude and love and appreciation. And I like to actually do something physically because I feel like for many people, it's really hard when you're when you're worn out from the day to uh, get into your gratitude. So if you can kind of do something that just puts you there automatically, it's a little easier. So whatever it is, whatever it is that you love, just spending some time every day. And if, if you set the intent saying, okay, I'd like to hear messages from my guidance, from spirit, from God, and then you do something that opens your heart, you'll start to get messages. Now, it's not going to be like a booming voice from the heavens, <laughs> you know? It's usually this subtle voice that comes in. And some people get images. Some people kind of get a knowing. Some people get like maybe they hear the guidance. Everyone's a little different, but your unique way of hearing guidance will come in when your heart's open. Yeah. And I feel for people, um, like if any listeners struggling or feels they're not getting guidance or don't have access to that. Guidance can really just come, like you said, in thoughts, ideas, or it can come through other people. And maybe their awareness is not that divine guidance is going to come through their best friend who's telling them to answer this ad or do this training. So just opening people's perspectives to how those messages can come through. And I've also noticed in my experience 
when it's a repeating message, when you hear an idea over and over, or you hear your friends say the same thing that you were just thinking about the other day, look for those repeating messages. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an awesome point. Usually things will appear multiple times if it's really your path. Yeah. So that's the first step is starting to get an idea of what you want to do. And then as far as action, just continuing to tune into the guidance. What's your perspective on that or next steps? I feel like it's different for everyone. And it's really continuing to tune into your guidance and you'll get the next step. And this is where the faith comes in because I know that's really hard for people because we all want a plan, you know, <laughs> like we want, okay, I need like the outline from here to the next five years. But I found that divine guidance is very much on the fly. It it's, comes in and it's not going to show you the 10 year plan. It'll show you the next step. And what do you do if you feel very strongly that you have this guidance to take this direction in your career, but your spouse doesn't support you or your family doesn't support you, friends don't support you? Do you have any advice in that area? I know it's really hard, but I feel that following your guidance anyways, and really working with your family to get their buy-in, to really help your family understand why you're doing what you're doing and why it's so important to you. I feel like if people really, truly love you, they'll support your path. I really do. And I know it may sound a little optimistic, but I just... <laughs> There's nothing wrong with optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, what I've found following my guidance is that like I'm so in tune with my guidance that it doesn't really matter what other people think, even my boyfriend or whatever it is. Like if I feel my guidance and people really love me, they'll allow me to be my truest self. Let's say someone who has followed their guidance, but they're not really making a lot of money back to that old question and then thinking that, well, maybe I got it wrong. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, that's a good one. I've had that question many times. Um, so I feel like true guidance comes from this deep knowing that you're on the right path. And then it's a matter of understanding that you're going to get some challenges along the way. And part of it is that financial thing that comes up a lot. And I feel like that's where the learning edge comes is how to overcome any challenge, whether it be with other people in your life or the finances. And I feel like with the money part, it's usually understanding what your story is that's creating the financial misalignment in the first place. And you'll know this because usually you'll have your guidance saying one thing and your story saying another. So for example, let me give you an example saying, let's say I wanted to do energy healing with a bunch of clients as my practice. So my guidance will be saying, all right, this is my true path is being in energy healing. I know it. This is what I love to do. And yet my fear says I shouldn't be charging money for it. I see this one a lot. So it's recognizing that the voice of fear is speaking, but the guidance is really your truth. And then it's like, how do you manage and deal with that part of yourself, the lower frequency part, right? That's saying I shouldn't be charging money. That's your work now. So by doing your work, by healing that part of yourself that feels like you don't deserve money or that you should be a martyr to the cause, for example, is part of the work on your path. Because interesting enough, and perhaps annoying uh, for some people, is that your life path is not only your greatest service, it's going to challenge you to overcome everything about yourself that's not in the highest and best. I agree with that. All the other areas of your life, they all kind of they all get in line with the guidance. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard because, you know, some of these patterns and stories are deeply, deeply ingrained. And it's like spirit is saying, all right, now it's time to overcome this. And you're like, oh my gosh, really? Can I just go back to doing something zombie-like, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know for me and a lot of different friends in the last year or two, a lot of friendships have fallen away. You know, and new friendships have come in, but it's tough to let go of those old friendships that don't serve you or that aren't in alignment. And the same goes for career. You know, things fall away and new opportunities come, but there's, I feel a mourning period that you need to do for things that do fall away that used to be such a big presence in your life. I think it can be really hard to lose friends. And it can also be really hard. Let's say your, your spouse is really not supportive at all. 
So you know your divine guidance, you know your truth, and your spouse is completely against it, right? Sometimes that needs to fall away. And that can be really, really hard. Yeah. I think a lot of people have gone through those kinds of major shifts in the last year, for sure. Yeah. And I have a lot of compassion for that because it can be a very difficult to lose the things that have been a major part of your life. It can be really hard. You know, we've all had to walk away from things that no longer served us. I think it's worth it because you're really pursuing your truth. And it really gets you in touch with joy again, especially if a lot of things in your life aren't in alignment with joy and you're not experiencing that on a regular basis, then you really need to take inventory. Joy is out there for everyone to experience. Life is here to bring you joy. So if that's not happening, it might be time to take some inventory. Yeah, I do that a lot because there, there are things in my life sometimes that don't bring joy. And it's like, why? How did I get here? How did this become such a joyless place? And you realize that sometimes what things need to fall away, there's things in the way of your joy. It could even be something as simple as that closet that you can't open anymore because there's so much stuff in it, right? Like sometimes you just have to create space for the new. Yeah. Decluttering is such a, in and of itself, is such a purging process. I think that's a big part of it too, is eliminating stuff that doesn't serve anymore. Eliminate all that negativity. Like I think a lot of people, like they have so much stuff and negativity in their life, they can't feel their joy because there's all this drama and craziness, right? So it's like, sometimes you have to go through that elimination process of like, okay, let's eliminate everything that doesn't serve. So I can even find out what serves, right? Because there's no space for it. Definitely. That's a good point because our possessions, our things, they absorb furniture, items in the house, they all absorb energy over time. And eventually you have all of this stuff of old programs, old stories sitting around in your house, keeping you stuck in that energy. For example, I'm in the process of moving to a new house and I'm getting rid of (laughs) probably 80 to 90% of my stuff because a lot of it is stuff I've had for over 10 years that I had back in Seattle. I'm purging it all out of my space. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the weirdest pieces of advice that I got from my guidance uh, when my business was struggling was like, oh, well, you need to do some cleanup. You need to eliminate files and clean up. And I'm like, how in the world is that going to relate to my money situation? I'm like, this is just a job. You know, it's like I was guided to clean up our files, right? And all this stuff hanging around. And what I realized is that by cleaning up all of that, I saved money, first of all. You know, and I realized some of the systems that weren't working, so it saved me money. So it was actually good guidance. And it also like simplified the business. So sometimes a lot of value can come from cleaning things out. Clutter, even in the digital world, like what comes across your Facebook feed? What files and old pictures are on your computer? What's stored on your phone? I have a lot of clients who have had issues with breakups and resolving relationships that have fallen away. And it's like, well, take a look at, you know, how are they coming back and attaching to you in your life? Like, do you have letters? Do you have pictures? Do you have gifts they've given you? All of this contains energy that's holding you in certain places. So that's another way for someone, an easy way for someone to purge and create shifts is just start making trips to goodwill. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's one of my favorite things to do because it really helps create space for the new. Definitely. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And sometimes with your body too, you know, doing like a cleanse, cleaning that out as well can help because then you can hear your guidance more readily when when it's not filtered through all kinds of junk food or whatever, you know, so sometimes that can help. That's a good point. Yeah. Purging your body. Do you feel that that's a pretty important thing to do when you are going through shifts or trying to receive guidance? I really feel like your diet can really affect your ability to hear guidance. And it's different for everyone, but I feel like the more fruits and vegetables you eat and the less junk you eat, um, the more easily it is to raise your vibration and hear your guidance. And I noticed for myself that when you start purging things in the beginning, you still have those cravings, but after a while you don't. So it's kind of that, can you get over that hump? (laughs) I think like, I mean, I I gave up soda, right? A long time ago. Like I used to live off of soda, like diet soda and regular Coke and stuff. And um, I remember one time I had given it up for a while and then I tried it again and it was like, oh my gosh, (laughs) this is crazy. Like 
you lose your taste for it after a while, but it's really hard to to give it up initially. Yeah, definitely. So if you think back to a time in your life where you were quote unquote normal before your exposure to energy work, exposure to spirituality with relation to careers and money, like what do you think it was that convinced you that spirituality was an important or divine guidance was an important correlation in how to live your life? Well, it actually started because I was frustrated with my health. I was taking uh, prescription drugs and it wasn't helping with my health. I had like really severe allergies and all kinds of problems. And I just got to that point where I was super frustrated. So I ended up changing my diet around to a raw food diet for a while. And what I noticed was it got rid of my health issues, but it also opened up my spiritual energy. And I started to be able to feel the universe as, as spirit. And once that happened, then everything started to change because then I discovered my life purpose was with the energy medicine and I could hear all the messages from spirit and it led me down my new path. So I had my awakening really with changing my diet actually grown out of a health problem. Oh, wow. So you did that physical purge, that physical clutter clearing. Mm -hmm. And it was just because I, I think some people can get so frustrated with their health problems or willing to do anything. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's just like pure desperation. That's what happened. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go to the doctor ever again. Now, I don't recommend people doing this, but what I did was I took my prescription medication and I trashed it one day, just the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this doesn't work anyways. Now, I would probably looking back think maybe if somebody wants to get off a of medication, just trashing it's probably not the best way to go, but that's <laughs> what I did. You know, most people recommend doctor supervised, you know getting off a medication because it it can mess you up if you just stop. But that's what I did and uh, started to say, I know I can do better than this prescription and I changed my diet. Everyone has their own unique journey, but that's what I did. Yeah. And I've noticed for myself that since switching to mostly organic, I'm not really, really strict about it, but organic, healthy eating, it's amazing how getting rid of chemicals, like even the household cleaning products in my house getting rid of all that toxicity really clears you up just without having to do anything. Yeah, I think that it's our natural state to be able to hear guidance. I mean, I think all the animals in nature hear it. I mean, but animals in nature generally don't, uh, they don't, they're not drinking soda. They're not eating dessert, right? They're out eating from nature, but I think they naturally can hear the guidance. Like it's just available to them because their body's kind of attuned to nature. And we, on the other hand, you know, we live in this society where we're indoors all the time and we're eating all this synthetic food. I think it makes it really harder to hear your guidance. And what would you say to the skeptics who don't believe in divine guidance and that this is just a lot of extra work for nothing? Um, that's a great point. You know, I think that it's not for everyone if they don't really believe in divine guidance. It's okay. I guess the question to ask skeptics is, are you happy? And I think some skeptics are very happy and and they're, they're totally fine. And I feel like when it's time for them to open up more deeply into their spirituality, they will just by the nature of they'll have their awakening. But some people aren't ready yet and that's okay. I think if there's a skeptic out there who's unhappy and miserable, it may be an opportunity for that skeptic to try something new. That's great advice. I haven't heard that perspective before. I love that. Yeah, I I realized, you know, that we're not here to convince anyone that this stuff is real, right? We'd be like barking up the wrong tree to do that because it's just, (laughs) you know, that's really not our job. That's kind of spirit's job is to help people grow. But but we can help facilitate people who are open. Yeah. All right, Jennifer. Well, thank you so much for dedicating your time today to talk with me. And I loved all the advice. So your book is Love Incorporated. Yeah, it's called Love Incorporated. And I actually have a website right now. Um, It's www.loveincorporatedthebook.com. And uh, I hope people get a chance to check it out. And uh, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, uh, I first wanted to ask you a few fun questions to let people get to know a different side of you. Yeah. Well, the first question is, what was your favorite music group or singer growing up? Oh, my... I had so many of them. Did you have any posters hanging up in your wall? (laughs) You know, actually, I didn't have any posters of groups because I was a gymnast, right? 
So I had a crush on Mitch Gaylord. Oh, yeah. I remember Mitch Gaylord. Was that from the 80s Olympics? From the 80s American Anthem. Yeah, he was an Olympic gymnast. And when I was in high school, that was my crush. So you weren't for <laughs> Bart Connors or? You know, something about Mitch Gaylord. I don't know what it was. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What level were you? My niece was a gymnast. Back in those days, uh, we had like three, two, one. Oh, very cool. And uh, yeah, back way long ago. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I was like, I did three optional. Was, that's what it was called back then. Nice. Do you ever miss it? I do. I really do. Yeah. I think gymnastics is something that once it gets in a kid's blood, they are always missing it on some level. Yeah, I know. And then I got into circus. I got, got into the flying trapeze. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And I did like a flying trapeze circus shows for a while. Wow. Was, yeah. It was super fun. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, secondly, what was your crowning achievement in middle school or something you were really proud of? Oh, I in middle school. You know, I think the moment I'm most proud of is we had a home ec course and there was a guy in this course who was a, a mentally disabled and he was having a hard time with the course. And I would spend my time in class helping him. Hmm. And one of the teachers said, wow, thank you so much for helping him. And that was probably the moment I remember most was being able to help this mentally disabled child in his class. Oh, that's very sweet. That was one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you made a big impact in his life. I hope I did. I just felt, I've just felt drawn to help him. What a nice memory. Um, okay. And lastly, what is the number one thing on your bucket list? The number one thing, oh my gosh, I have so many on my bucket list. I think the number one thing is there's this trail in China that goes up to this little cafe in the middle of the mountains. It's a really hard trail to do, and I forget the name of it. And it's like stairs, and it's a crazy trail, and I really want to do that. Oh, that sounds unique. It's very unique. It's, yeah. It's death-defying, right, that you're you're hanging over the edge on some places, and it leads up to this tiny little cafe, and... I wish I remembered the name of it, but that's on my list. And now I'm wondering, like, how does the cafe get their food? <laughs> I know. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pay $30 yeah. for a latte. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, thank you for doing this interview. And what's your website again? Actually, there's two. There's the energy healing one, which is www.quantumtouch.com. And then there's my book website, which is www.loveincorporatedthebook.com. Thank you for listening to Woo Woo for the Skeptic. I would love to hear from you if you have ideas for a show or want to give feedback on an episode. And if you enjoyed this episode on career guidance, please subscribe to the show in your podcast app so that you never miss another episode. And now for your moment of woo. This quote comes from the Dalai Lama, who said, Our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. Have a great week, everyone.